Welcome to the Auto Success Executive Spotlight. My name is Brian Ankney. I'm your host today, and my guests are Natalie Kessler and Dave Dunn from Masters Auto Body. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad you came. You. Is this your first time in Akron, Ohio? No, it's we've been to Akron a few times and in the area a few times, going back uh, Firestone Country Club and some other interesting places. We hope to visit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame today. Nice, that'll be fun. Second most important thing we're doing today. <laughs> <laughs> you finished the first one a little bit ago, right? <laughs> cool. Well, let's let's get started with just a little bit about about you, Dave. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, you know your career path and what led you to where you are today? Probably a little bit of a non-traditional approach. Uh, dropped out of high school at a young age, went to work in a body shop, which uh, I did for a couple of years. And at the age of 19, struck out on my own, thought I could do it better than the guy I was working for. Mm -hmm. And uh, that worked out pretty well. I, I did it for about a year on my own in a, a dealership, a Lincoln Mercury dealership, came along and offered me a job managing their body shop. So now at age 20, I'm a dealership body shop manager. Uh, fell in love with the place, fell in love with the business, got all kinds of coaching and mentoring from a good organization with a great reputation. Mm -hmm. That shop, when I was about 22, caught on fire and burned down. And so um, I decided they would try to get me to stay with the organization, but I really liked the body shop business, and they decided they weren't going to go back into it. So I went out and rented a spot right where I'm at today, Days Auto Body, Galesburg, Illinois, on Grand Avenue, started my own shop, and that was... 48 years ago. Wow. And it's uh, worked out pretty well. We um, were in a pretty good position by the time I was in my early 30s and started doing some consulting. And uh, people had heard that I would had a measure of success considering my background. Mm -hmm. And uh, then about 28 years ago, we started this thing called Master's School of Auto Body Management, which was uh, a way to get people to come to us rather than us going to them. And uh, that's worked out pretty well. Natalie, you, you want to share with us a little bit about yourself and, and your career path? Absolutely. So uh, I started out as a teacher of uh, school age children and um, wasn't really super excited about it. And then I met Dave and um, we shared a lot of interest in alternative education. And um, so he said, oh, I've got this project. Could you come and help me with it for a couple months? And that was just going to be it. And I was going to go back to school and um, then he said, you know, you you know about as much a, about this program as anyone else does and so why don't you work for me? And I said, okay. And that was 28 years ago and wow. never looked back. I, I might add, uh, it wasn't long before I could see because there was a lot of interest in um, value-added programs, paint companies, manufacturers and so on. I could see that somebody was going to try to steal her away. So I talked her into buying a portion of the company pretty early on. So she uh, got a commercial loan and purchased part of the company, and we've been partners now for, for the 28 years. Wow. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about the dealership. Um, you know, when, it, when a dealer is trying to determine whether, you know, getting into uh, the body shop business is right for them, you know, what are the things that they need to consider? It's really a... a it, you know, it can be kind of a blessing and a malediction to a car dealer. Uh, many dealers have kind of made the decision to just get out of the business simply because uh, fixed costs, the equipment costs, and so on are pretty great, and there's some risk. Um, one of the things that it can do is uh, it can help to enhance the lifetime relationship and the buying relationship that a dealer hopes to gain with a customer, you know, hoping to not just sell them one car over a lifetime. Uh, the flip side of that is a poor body deal, let's say a mismanaged claim or a repair that didn't come out as good as it should have, can sabotage maybe years of relationship buying with that customer. So we, uh, we talk pretty seriously to our dealer clients about making sure that if they're going to do it, they need to get in it or get out of it. You know, I mean, even even with the best of intentions, I mean, occasionally, if you fix enough cars, you're going to have some repairs that don't come out. You know the way you want to. I mean, what what would a de what should a dealer do in, in that situation that you just brought up? You know, like you've got a customer that's been with you for 15 years. They buy two cars every five years from you, and you know, unintentionally the repair's not right. What what should a dealer do? Well, ba backing up a little bit, um, we would encourage our dealers to not wait for that reactive situation. You know, a pound a pound of prevention being better than a, a pound of cure. I can tell you that many times the dealer is sort of 
let the body shop be at the back of the dealership. And the the old joke is kind of in our industry that a lot of the dealer principals couldn't find their way to the body shop with a map because <laughs> they just haven't paid much attention. You know, the, the focus has been on parts, service, and certainly sales. So we want to make sure that the clients that we partner with uh, are serious about it and serious about making sure that the collision repair shop is equipped properly, but not just equipped properly, trained properly in customer service, just like they would their service representatives or their sales representatives. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, I, I also want to talk about culture because I know, I know, I know that that's something that's really important to you guys. Um, and, and really every dealership right now, culture is a big deal. I mean, for the first time ever, we have five generations working side by side in dealerships. And that's, that's a, that's a big challenge to have a great culture, you know, what, what can a dealership do to develop a good culture in their, in their store? So anybody who's read anything that we write or have attended any of our programs knows that we spend a great deal of time about um, intentional communication. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we teach at Masters is to make sure that this communication is, is formal and regular, not just an annual review, not just a performance review, but try to be as proactive as possible and making sure that we're all on the same page. We recommend that's every 90 days, every quarter, every single employee face to face with whoever their supervisor happens to be. And the point of that is we can reinforce the values, the dealership wide values, making sure that we're cohesive and congruent with those ideas within the body shop, just like it was any other department. And so with that culture also, you find that you're able to attract better people. You know, nobody wants to work in a, in a divisive culture or a toxic culture. And that can be prevented, again, primarily through communication and making sure that we're all on the same page. Okay. But are, be, beyond, beyond meeting with your people every 90 days, I mean, are there any cool tips or tricks that you could share that you've seen, you know, that, that, that dealerships do to, to build that kind of team culture? Yeah, I, I would say that one of the most important things is being uh, unabashedly afraid of uh, of uh, or unafraid of training and making sure that we are doing what we can to invest in the body shop. You know, the people who fix cars are very interested in the technology and it's very frustrating if they find that, particularly in the dealer world, that maybe they're not even as well equipped as the independent down the street. One of the things that has been uh, pr pretty common lately is the idea that uh, factory certifications are available now through most of the manufacturers. It's surprising to me how few dealership body shops are actually factory certified. Really? Yeah, even within their own brand. A lot of times the big independent down the street will have done that investment, which requires some training as far as repair technique and methods, but also equipment, which there's some equipment purchases that are required there. And those kind of things really resonate with the collision repair community. So as far as building a good culture is related to that, it really matters that people are working with good things. A clean, bright, sophisticated environment is what people today want to work in, and they're not going to settle for much less. When you, when you talk about the collision repair community, I mean, so so if the people that are working at one collision repair facility, are they're, they, they're aware of the tools that the, that the one up the street has? Is, I mean, is that is that accurate? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a... You know, it's an industry that has maybe 40,000 collision repair shops, give or take a little bit, throughout the United States. Uh, you have large consolidators, of course, that are, you know, people like Caliber Collision that have well over 1,600 points now around the United States. So um, it's, I guess it's relatively small in, in when you only think of 40,000 repair shops. But in every community, the body shop people talk to one another. The insurance people talk to one another. The insurance partners understand now that it's very important for them to make sure that the car is repaired properly because they have a, a big stake in the game as well. And so the, that community uh, does a lot of con conversation with one another, and uh, it's very important that we make sure that we maintain a top-of-the-mind positioning in those markets. Now, back to culture. Natalie, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, within your business, what, what, what do you guys do to really foster a good culture inside of, of, of your business and within Masters? Well, um, we're all united uh, uh, to helping the people that we work with. And um, I don't know, it's, I don't even think of, we don't have much controversy <laughs> among our 
selves. Um, you know, Dave and I speak daily about uh, what we're doing and the people that we work with and uh, the people that we're going to work with. Um, so again, I guess it's back to communication and having the same uh, result that we, that we want to achieve um, and talking about it, which is true in, um, we know this from like a lot of people that we've worked with over the years, uh, the people who have been successful, more successful, uh, our communicators and share information. One of the things that um, kind of helped Masters get started right around the time we were starting Masters, I'd written a book called Liquid Amalgam. <clears throat> and it's a book about uh, principle-centered leadership and making sure that we define in very specific terms what the ethical playing field is mm -hmm. and how important that is. So in our case, uh, the values that we present, we, we uh, believe in the value of honesty, excellence, accommodation, and profitability, and we treat those as values. So we define those pretty clearly with every single person that we work with, whether it be on the collision repair shop side that we own or masters in our consulting and training. One of the things I learned from Ken Blanchard a lot of years ago in the One Minute Manager was to hire character and teach skills. And I think that's a good lesson for the collision repair industry, too, and our clients, that a lot of times we will kind of look the other way with character issues because somebody is so talented at a technical level. And that's like pouring poison into the family. We don't, we don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, goes back and forth between the way we operate masters and the consulting end of things as well as the repair shop that we operate. You know, well, let's stay with masters for a second. You know, with... with with masters, your guys train. You have trainers that are out there working with people, and that that that, or they come to you and you and you work with them. How 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 do you select for your trainers, and and why are they so uniquely qualified? Yeah, that's a good question, and we're proud of the fact that every single person who teaches for us at Masters, whether they are uh, an on-site teacher, somebody who may go out and do consulting, or a classroom teacher, has to be in the business. We're not people who used to be in the business. We're not people who sold our businesses. We're not people who failed in the business. We are in the business daily. And so you have to be making your living from the collision repair business in order to work for masters. So we have uh, a variety of instructors around the country. Uh, one of our uh, associates that's been with us now for 25 years is Jerry Enders. He has multiple shops in California. And uh, in his case, he started out, when, when we first started partnering with him, he was partnering with dealership body shops. He's now branched into independent repair body shops, too. So we cover kind of a, a broad scope of people, both the independent and the dealer world. But all of our instructors have to feel the pain on a daily basis of what it is that we do and what we're trying to instruct. I, this this is kind of a goofy question, but I, I, you know anybody who works in the car business and touches lots of cars, lots of customer cars, has some funny stories. Tell me tell me something that is funny. That's like what's one of the more funny things that you found in a car that that you're working on? Oh my goodness, funny thing found <laughs> in the car. Uh, I got to be careful what I reveal I here. Don't mention uh, any names. Let's just say you'll find the publication every now and then that you like. Why would somebody leave that in their car? <laughs> you know, prob well, probably, you know, a bag of weed or something like that is, that's not uh, highly uncommon to see. To find in there. Yeah, that's right. Small town. We live yeah. in a small town. We, oh. don't, we don't find that many interesting things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk about, it's kind of the million dollar question. Um, you know, when, when in the body shop world, you're serving a customer, you're serving an insurance company, and, and you're serving your own business, you know, how, how can a car dealer who's got a million balls up in the air, how, how can they be success, how can they successfully manage all those relationships, especially with the insurance company and the customer maybe not having exactly the same goals? Yeah, right. We, we feel like that's maybe one of the most difficult things and one of the things many dealers fail at, where they kind of go all in to please the insurance company which uh, we don't hate insurance companies. We're glad we are dealing with insurance companies. But at the same time, they're, they have a vested interest in making sure the repair is done cheap. We have a vested interest in making sure the car is repaired well. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest mistakes that dealers make is they get themselves in these contractual preferred provider agreements, often called DRP, direct repair programs. 
And uh, they kind of sell out their own values sometimes for the sake of maintaining a, an insurance relationship. And in today's world, that's a real big red flag. We don't want our dealer customers to be doing that because, again, they want that lifetime buying cycle. And, they, and, and the, oftentimes, one of the things I learned from a, a General Motors study a few years back, you know, 65% of uh, newer car owners, a GM variety, wanted the dealer to perform the collision repair on the car. And yet, rarely is there a GM dealer body shop around that handles any close to that percentage of the market. So uh, as a friend of mine from Toyota said a number of years ago, he said, if, if a customer walks in our door and they are 60 to 85% predisposed for us to repair the car, and we're only capturing 20% of those cars, do we even have a sales program or do we have a sales prevention program? Yeah. And I think uh, that has to be taken pretty seriously. But unfortunately, dealers will get together, they'll be at the 20 groups, and they'll be talking about how they've made uh, this deal with XYZ Insurance Company and they've discounted their services. And that oftentimes comes back to bite them. The people who have been most successful that we deal with are the people who, uh, they're not anti-insurance, but they see their first customer as the car owner, not the insurance company. And they, they draw that line when there's a, a loyalty question between the two. I mean, so the, so the dealers that don't enter into those agreements, are, are they, I mean, do those insurance companies force their, their insured people to go somewhere else? Or is it, I mean, how does that work? So it, it kind of varies from state to state. Most states have some form of anti-steering law. In other words, the customer has the right to get their car repaired anywhere they want. The ambiguity comes in with, yeah, they can get it fixed anywhere they want, but we'll only pay this much. And so what we try to do at Masters is help people navigate that to figure out a way to get along with the insurance companies and still remain profitable. But even more than remaining profitable, making sure the integrity of the repair is uh, honored and, and kept up. And so it's pretty important for us to make sure that our dealer clients understand what's at stake when they enter into a, a direct repair agreement, because sometimes those direct repair people will encourage repairs that would violate the very rules that the manufacturers have set up for repairing the automobile properly. Oh wow! Now is that is that is that by because maybe they're re repairing something that should be replaced, or is it because they're using a subpar part, or all of the above? Or? Yeah, all of the above. So. There may be situations where the, the uh, insurance company will ask them to splice a welded part, whereas uh, all of the industry training, ICAR, uh, position statements from the car manufacturers will say, absolutely, do not splice this. This needs to be welded at the factory seam. Uh, those are the kind of arguments that happen a lot. And there's always some guy down the street that will do it the, the wrong way because, you know, they're here today, gone tomorrow. But uh, the dealer client, since they have this hopefully lifetime buying cycle and this purchasing relationship, uh, will want to make sure the integrity of the repair comes first. And usually we can figure out a way to work that out. But, you know, the insurance companies will kind of bluff and make it sound like there's some way that they can force the improper repair when, in fact, we need to make the decision for how the car is repaired properly. Well, oh, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're the one that's responsible for the repair because you did it, right? I mean, yeah, we're the one that gets sued. Yeah, you don't want somebody driving around in a car that's not safe. Yeah. And, and again, you know, I'm not trying to just overly um, exaggerate the, the problem, but it is a problem. And uh, it's one that is kind of growing where you sort of have the people who are saying, no, we're going to fix the car well. And you have the other people say, no, we're just going to please the insurance company and do it cheaply. And uh, it, it appears that the people who are who have decided that the integrity of the repair matters or that the relationship with the car owner matters are the people who are starting to prosper. Now, this this is a question that I, I you know it just comes to mind today because we you know Babcock's our body shop business brand put out a study today that showed that 18 percent of our respondent body shops were uncomfortable with with some EV repairs. Now the, the majority were comfortable, but 18 uh, percent were not comfortable. How how comfortable are you with EVs? And are, I mean, do you see issues with training or or getting you know new tools or like like what 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 needs to happen to be successful repairing EVs? Well, this is the real golden opportunity currently for the dealer because they will have first access to the data 
and the training, the factory training uh, associated with EVs. Uh, I would say that anybody who sells EVs right now, if they're in the collision business, um, they're probably pretty comfortable with it. I think on the independent side, there's a little bit more do we or do we not uh, yeah. equip and train ourselves. I know at my own store in uh, Galesburg, Illinois, we, uh, we are heavily invested in EV and continue to look at more opportunity for EV simply because other people are not doing it. And we believe it's going to be here and it's going to be here to stay. Yep. Well, I mean, I was at a Dodge dealer yesterday and I mean, starting, starting that, you know, next year, well, you know, the, the, the gas powered muscle cars are gone. They're going to all be EV muscle cars. And so when people are, are drag racing those and, and playing with those and bumping into curbs, I mean, they're going to be coming to you and you better be prepared to fix them, right? That's right. Yeah. And uh, actually, as far as, you know, most of what you do on the EV car is literally no different than a, than a gas engine car. Uh, but you have considerations, you know, for appropriate uh, disassembly, appropriate di disconnecting and how you handle the EV, reconnecting things to make sure that you're not um, damaging any of the ADAS system or things like that. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, they're... I, I don't know. I don't know that we'll be you know, as, as as far along the EV path in 2035 as some of our states think. But I, I mean, it's definitely coming. I mean, it's definitely coming. We were in California recently, and uh, I was amazed at the the car rental place, the Hertz place. About 20 percent of the offerings were EV, and uh, of course they have the infrastructure there. You know, particularly like if it's a Tesla, there's a place to plug it in, kind of, and everywhere you go. So uh, I know even in our store in Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, we have a public charging station. That was something GM required when we went GM certified. Uh, and people come to town and plug in their cars, and you know we don't even charge them for it. It's just something that we offer as a service to the community. That's nice. That's nice. We, we actually, we actually, just this year, we had a, we have one charger that's out in our parking lot, and then we have one in the garage. You know, because we all we have different vehicles. I mean, like when we're shooting videos with with EVs, you got to charge them, right? <laughs> right. Right down the road from us in Illinois, in Bloomington, Illinois, is the Rivian plant where, uh, of course, they're building a, a lot of those big vans for Amazon right now. But they have a really cool truck and a really cool EV uh, vehicle that uh, is available to the general public. And uh, so, you know, we're in the process of certification with Rivian right now. Boy, their, their, their SUV is just absolutely stunningly beautiful. I mean, it, it is a gorgeous vehicle. And you can spot it a mile away. You know, yeah. it, it's distinctive. <laughs> which yeah. I think is pr pretty interesting stuff. So, you know, most of what we repair, Chevy's, Ford's, Honda's, Chrysler's, Toyota's, you know, common brands for the Midwest. But uh, we feel like we need to be uh, aware of and ready for anything that comes down the pipe. Yep. Well, who, I mean, who knows? You might have some hydrogen hydrogen vehicles here soon, too. And, I mean, plug-in hybrids, <clears throat> I mean, dealers can't even keep a plug-in hybrid on the lot. I mean, right. Those are Those are hot right now. Uh, speaking of hydrogen, when we were in California just a month or so ago, I saw my first hydrogen car going oh, down the did? road. Yeah, it was a Toyota, you know, and like, oh my, very distinctive. You can see it. So again, infrastructure will be the thing there and, you know, how fast that grows, who knows? Yep. Cool. Well, is there anything else you guys would like to share with our audience today? Go ahead. Probably thousands of things, but uh, <laughs> I know we're living on time. I will just say this, that um, I, I have an article coming out in auto success I probably in August uh, and I think the title is something like get in or get out and I think that's the message so even though we make our living counseling people who are in the collision repair business largely dealers we've had uh, right at 7,000 people go through our program now oh wow um, we still would rather you not be in the business than be in the business in a poor situation that'll hurt your brand long term so that's, that is a, a message you will hear whether you see me giving a speech for, you know, uh, your trade association or wherever you might hear me. But uh, that's a common theme, and we hope you, you listen to that. Great. Well, thank you guys for coming. It's our pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. thank you for taking the time to join us for this Auto Success Executive Spotlight interview. I'm your host, Brian Ankney, and today my guests have been Natalie Kessler and Dave Dunn from Masters Auto Body. We hope to see you again soon. This episode is Over the Curb and Burning Gas.